The person I'll be talking to today is Mr. Uh, Jurabek Sanakolov. Mr. Jurabek, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, there are, you know, towns mm -hmm. and you need to travel a lot to get from one town to another. When I look at those videos, I want to do the same, but when it actually comes to doing, mm -hmm. especially the, you know, catching and killing animals part, mm -hmm. I don't think I will be able to do that. Yeah. Every time I think of a desert or mountain or forest, I, I, I get reminded of all those videos I watch on YouTube about people, like you said, uh, living in the wild and cooking their own food, right? And making their own tent, just surviving out there. You know, schools, or let's just say lyceums. I didn't feel like I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was sort of a servant. And the other big recommended, well, you should choose speaking. Um, and then I said, well, okay. And then I started sending sample answers. And in like two, three months, my channel just blew up blew up right yeah my, my core value as a teacher is at, at the at the center of everything is results yeah. all in caps <laughs> all in caps i try to encourage them to learn as much as they can all the you know parts of ielts is, doesn't make sense make sense in except for reading yeah. i use chat gpt to improve my essays yeah mm -hmm. i use chat gpt to brainstorm mm -hmm. but at the same time i know what to steal from it mm -hmm. and i know what to leave it leave it out yeah so what is your favorite video game so what is your favorite video game i used to have a friend when i was in the when i was staying at university dorm and he would play dota two three four o'clock in the morning still be on his computer i mean i and do the same <laughs> yeah. oh as someone bachelor looking for a partner what are some qualities you look for and a good spouse. I, I think that wouldn't look good as a married man. Uh, oh, <laughs> so, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So imagine me describing uh, what I what I, I look for in. I, I just in, didn't in, see that wedding so, wedding ring on your fingers. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't wear wear yeah, so a I wedding thought, ring, I but he was bachelor. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> Hey folks, hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Adustra Muse. I'm your host, Muhammad Ali here. Today, I'm going to be talking to another awesome guest. And I'm, I'm before we start this podcast, I asked you guys to do us a favor and please subscribe to this channel and that would help us a lot. So, all right, back to my guests. The person I'll be talking to today is Mr. Uh, Jurabek Sanakolov. Mr. Jurabek, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's uh, such a pleasure to be sitting down talking to you today. And yeah, I, mean, I really appreciate you coming all the way from Tashkent to be on the podcast. I mean, actually, I was in Naoi, uh -huh. and that's uh -huh. one of the reasons why I agreed to come with uh -huh. my friend. Uh -huh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. um, Would you like to tell our audience a little about yourself? Well, um, I guess some people probably know what uh -huh. I do. Yeah, I'm a mm -hmm. teacher mm -hmm. and I have also a background in teaching. Um, so I've been working as a teacher for about seven, eight years. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching IELTS in particular um, since 2021. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I have quite an experience, I'd say, in teaching because I've also worked in uh, several state lyceums. Um, and then um, now I've been working with my friend Diorbek in Diorbek's IELTS in Tashkent, mm -hmm. teaching IELTS. Right, right. So you originally come from Navai, right? Yes. What, what, what was it like growing up in Navai? It was fine. Um, it was... Actually, uh, I went to school in Naoi as well, and I enjoyed the experience. Um, during my school years, though, I was not that interested in, you know, English. I was more of a, you know, sport guy. Yeah, I used to play football and basketball and hand, handball and you name it. So um, I was also into math, uh, but... Uh, after that, once I entered the Lyceum, 
uh, in Nao E2, uh, I started to, you know, grow interested in uh, learning English. And then I changed my, changed my major into English mm -hmm. because I was studying math and physics back then. And then I changed to English and then the rest is history, let's mm -hmm. say. Right. Wow. So, Navaya, right? Uh, what's life is like in Navaya? I mean, it's a small so city. A... Um, almost, I mean, where I live, I mm. live in, you know, part of a town called Old City. Mm -hmm. and so, um, I mean, just like in Bukhara, we have the Old City and the city itself, right? So, I came from the Old City. Yeah? It's a famous place. Yeah? So, um, people are quite friendly. Um, we kind of know each other because I said that the city is quite small. Uh, it's probably made up of at most thousand or you know, thousand and a half households. Mm. So you can imagine it's quite small. So, um, yeah, that, that, that's how life is. It's not that developed, but it's a developing city. Mm. Um, there aren't many skyscrapers like in Bukhara or Samarkand or in Tashkent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't actually have many skyscrapers here. Only one I know is the Hakimiyat building, right? The government headquarters. But, and, it's, you know, and they're actually pulling it down. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, they're, yeah, they're demolishing it. Yeah. Right. So what I'm trying to say is in Bukhara, I've been yeah. spending, you know, past two days in Bukhara yeah. and Everywhere I look, there's something to look at. Uh -huh. Yeah, but that's not the case in Nawai. Uh -huh. um, there are, you know, some old, rusty, mm -hmm. you know, buildings, mm -hmm. apartments, mm -hmm. but that's about it. Yeah, we have right. just one or two parks. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a cozy place, mm -hmm. I'd say. Um, the life is quite slower. Mm -hmm. uh, at least to me, it feels so. Um, compared to living in Tashkent, because now I've been living in Tashkent and life is, you know, very, very fast. Mm -hmm. It just, in a blink of an eye, blink of an eye, it's just, your day is over mm -hmm. and you have to prepare for the next day. Mm -hmm. But in Nawaii, uh, for the past, you know, 30 days or so, I've been living in Nawaii because I'm on a holiday and life is good there. <laughs> I mean, I, I was just enjoying myself. Yeah. There. So, yeah, that's how it feels like. Right. Live in Nawai. Geographically speaking, Nawai is one of the biggest regions in Uzbekistan. Is it yes. not the biggest? It, it is the biggest regions, yeah, but... Is it bigger than Nukus, Karakal, Pakistan? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about Karakal, Pakistan, but if you look at the map, uh -huh. if I remember the map correctly, yeah, uh -huh. if the map hasn't changed a lot since I looked at it for the last time, now it is huge in terms yeah. of the, you know, yeah. overall area. But a huge part of now is made up of a desert, mm -hmm. uh, Kizilkum Desert. And uh, there are, you know, towns mm -hmm. and you need to travel a lot to get from one town to another. Yeah? Mm -hmm. For example, if you want to go to Nurata, yeah, which is one of the biggest uh, well, how do you say, provinces in, mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in Nawai, you need to travel for like an hour and a half or two. Mm -hmm. If you want to go to Uchkuduk, for example, mm -hmm. you need to travel for around four hours, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's big, but most of it mm -hmm. is just empty. Right. You ever gone to the desert? Yeah, I went to the desert. And and what, what do you guys do in the desert? I mean, I've there, heard, there heard... aren't Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of things that you can do in a uh -huh. desert, but you know, I'm very into sky watching, uh, yeah, yeah. stargazing, let's right. just say. And whenever mm -hmm. I had the chance, I have mm -hmm. the chance, I you know, go to the desert just to enjoy the view because of the light pollution, you cannot see the stars as clearly as you can in, in, a, in a desert. Mm -hmm. So I just go there with a friend. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I'm scared <laughs> because there are, you know, all sorts of animals living oh, there. Oh, yeah, in, in you desert. better be yeah. scared when you go into a desert all by yourself. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's scary. It's it should feel scary yeah, yeah. because I've watched, you know, several movies uh -huh. and where people get kidnapped and stuff. Yeah, right. But that's not the point. The point is <laughs> I just <laughs> go there and look at the sky and take a picture or two uh -huh. because, you know, I just like looking at the stars and planets and... Mm -hmm. That's why I go to a yeah. desert. Yeah. I don't see any other reason why you should go to go to a desert. I heard people go to the desert sometimes to go hunting. 
To be hunting. To go hunting, yeah. Yes. To try hunting. Uh, I'm not sure about that. Yes, I've heard that you know in some parts of Navoi, yeah, there there are you know places where you can hunt, you can mm-hmm. go hunting, but I'm not. I don't know much about it to be mm-hmm. honest. Uh, I have, you know, friends, acquaintances, and stuff that talked about such things, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure. Right, right. Because I actually want to give it a shot. Yeah. Try hunting. I mean, and why though? It, yeah. Why the, kill animals? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I mean, for for obvious reason, we're apex predators, right? Humans, top of the food chain, I mean, right? Yes. And, and there's, that makes sense, but. but there's there's something you know so crude about going and catching your own food and 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 skinning it and cooking it and enjoying it right sound i don't know (laughs) barbaric yes very much vulgar like the way you're describing it i mean what if I didn't know you, I, mean, I would just say I would just ask, "What kind of sociopath are okay. you?" Yeah. So. But let me let me let me ask you this: Like when you go to a fast food restaurant, all right, you're enjoying that burger. Where do you think that meat come from? I mean, <laughs> and how's that? I, I how, mean, how there's a killing... difference between growing your food mm-hmm. and then just going and killing an animal that's just going about life. But you are complicit in that. When you, if when you consume meat, when you eat meat, you're complicit. I'm, I mean, part of for the crime. record, I'm not a vegan. Yeah, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just playing, you know, devil's yeah. advocate here. Yeah. yeah, but yeah, I do believe that hunting would feel and will. I mean, should feel amazing uh-huh. because, uh, I mean, when you cook mm-hmm. your food, for example, mm-hmm. yeah, it's just going to feel mm-hmm. uh, much tastier, I guess. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but when you get all the ingredients by yourself mm-hmm. yeah by killing the animal and mm-hmm. skinning the animal the way mm-hmm. you described it uh-huh. i mean i'm just i mean it should feel amazing uh, you you ever seen anyone butcher a cow or a sheep no growing up never i mean i have seen once uh-huh. and since then i decided well yeah. i can't you know yeah. look at this thing that's just so you but know. the thing is, when I was a child, uh-huh. probably I was in you know school and stuff. Mm-hmm. I used to butcher animals like you, chicken and stuff uh-huh. uh, with your own hands. Yes. How yeah, did you? Mind. How did you go from that to this? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, it, 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 it you know, I, add up. I do sound kind of you know ironic here. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the word. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but as I grew up, I. Uh-huh. I also grew, mm-hmm. you know, kind of empathetic towards animals, uh-huh. I guess. Uh-huh. Um, now I cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, now I cannot watch any living being mm. being killed, let's uh-huh. just say. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I enjoy meat, uh-huh. all sorts of it. But, uh-huh. you know, looking yeah. at an animal being butchered, mm-hmm. slaughtered. I'm not here advocating for animal abuse or anything. I am just describing that there is, uh, there is, there is fulfillment to to there, there's you mean? They, not not killing. There's there's really fulfillment to chasing something and 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 finally yeah. catching it and then and then skinning skinning that animal and eviscerating it and then. Cutting it into parts and then sharing it with people you love and care. It's just some, that's the way things have always been, right? Yes, I Since mean, it does start provide a sense of like accomplishment, I guess, mm-hmm. yeah, like a sense of pride in right. what you do. And right. even though the, the thing is, mm-hmm. you know, the thing that you do is mm-hmm. quite terrible mm-hmm. in the eyes of, you know, some people, right? Mm-hmm. But yeah. It does. I mean, I mm-hmm. actually watch a lot of videos. Mm-hmm. I mean, survival videos. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a guy alone going into mm-hmm. a forest or mountains, right. living there for a week or two, right. catching right. fish, uh, yeah. all sorts of animals, and killing yeah. and cooking. I mean, there's something soothing about these mm-hmm. videos. Mm-hmm. I mean, when I look at those videos, I want to do the same. But when it actually comes to doing, mm-hmm. especially the you know catching and killing animals part, mm-hmm. I don't think I will be able to do that. Yeah, um, it's not because I'm scared, mm-hmm. uh, but more because uh, 
I cannot do that. Yeah, like what, it's just. What do you think changed your perspective on that? Because you're telling me you come from background of killing your own food, <laughs> yes. chicken, and yes. you know sheep to I, I, I being know that this. Too. I mean, I mean, I think about it a lot actually. Uh -huh. Like now, I mean, sometimes you just reflect, right? Like uh -huh. I just think, well, I used to do that. Yeah, I, you know, mm -hmm. didn't even bat an eye. Yeah, like, but now. I cannot do that. What changed? What happened? Uh, so, I guess, I mean, I've seen some drama. Yeah, mm -hmm. there has been some drama in my life as well. As well, I've seen some suffering, and kind of, probably, I'm not sure whether this is the case. This is the exact case. Probably, I started putting myself in others' shoes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Including animals. Yes, including animals. <laughs> I mean, right. I started, you know, I I started becoming kind of against all sorts of violence mm -hmm. uh, because I have seen enough violence mm -hmm. in my life and in others' mm -hmm. lives as well. I've seen enough suffering. Mm -hmm. So probably that's the thing that mm -hmm. kind of changed my perspective, mm -hmm. um, but I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you grow, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you still enjoy eating meat. <laughs> yes, yeah, that, yeah, that's not going to change anytime soon, I guess. Right, right. Anyway, uh, I brought this up because every time I think of a desert or mountain or forest, I, I, I get reminded of all those videos I watch on YouTube about people, like you said, uh, living in the wild and cooking their own food, right, and making their own tent just surviving out there right and there's there's something primitive and 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 very uh, very natural about yes. that sort of you know existence because now we're all wrapped in and in, in our technology we have we got our own castles we got yes. our acs but not long ago people didn't really have these you know privileges they didn't yeah. really have these con conveniences for the experience, yeah. Yeah. right? I mean, now that you were mm -hmm. you know, talking, I kind of had another idea why I changed my perspective towards animals. Mm -hmm. um, um, maybe that's because I started learning English, uh -huh. and, and English exposed me to all sorts of you know mm -hmm. knowledge. Let's just say, yeah. And I mean, one of the things that I read is that animals are very much sentient, and mm -hmm. like they have. Uh, understanding of the world uh just as i mean almost as much as humans do uh, like they do have families they have some kind of sense of friendship uh, they mourn they suffer they mm -hmm. kind of uh they also have like trauma yeah we just mm -hmm. when we think about animals especially in uzbekistan i guess yeah the idea of animals that most people have is that they're just food. They're just animals. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you just, you know, research and read about them and just really watch, you can see that animals are not that different mm -hmm. to humans. Uh, they mm -hmm. have families. They have friends. Mm -hmm. They suffer. Mm -hmm. They remember things mm -hmm. uh, from the past. They can, I mean, they say that, uh, I mean, humans are one of the, uh, you know, creatures that can mentally travel you know, to the future and past. But now new research says that animals can actually do that as well. Yeah, they can remember the death of their compa compa companion, let's just say, their friends or uh, the fact that their mother was killed by a poacher. They can remember all this stuff. Um, so... Maybe this is another reason why I started to change my perspective towards animals. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I would put it down mm -hmm. to English and the things that I read about mm -hmm. animals in general. Right, right. It's, it's a, actually quite a bit of controversial topic. Yes. Yeah, and I would love to talk more about that, but... Uh, we're not here to talk about animals, right? We're here to talk about your 
uh, your your experience, your background. So let's 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 talk about that too, because I, I, I want to make sure we have plenty of time for th those questions as sure, well. Sure, sure, sure. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You. When did you move to Tashkent, and when well, when did that when did that change happen? Um, I first went to Tashkent to work mm -hmm. specifically in 2021 mm -hmm. September when I started working in IELTS Zone mm -hmm. uh, with Big Zot Mrahmedov. And after working there about a year, mm -hmm. I had to, you know, go back to my hometown, Nawahi, and mm -hmm. I started my own education center there. Mm -hmm. And after running the education center for, for like a year, I decided to came, come back to Tashkent again. Oh, why? Why? Why did you make that? I mean, I uh, things I mean, didn't I, work I talked out. about this before on one of the podcasts, actually. Podcasts, actually. Like the reason was, I mean, every time I go to Tashkent, I kind of grow personally. Uh, uh, my knowledge improves. My teaching improves. So I decided to look for another challenge. So I hmm. went back to Tashkent. And, you know, started mm -hmm. teaching there again. And I also started working on myself. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that's when I actually scored 8.5 in writing for the first time. Uh, the first week of me going there, I didn't have anything to do. Yeah, like the groups were forming and stuff. So I didn't have anything to do. So I decided to take the test. So for about a week, I worked really hard on myself i guess i have never worked that hard in my life uh, in terms of my preparation and stuff so that's the reason yeah i just went there to look for a challenge because i wanted to grow personally because in naoi you don't have much of a competition to be honest yeah um i was very comfortable in naoi mm, i was teaching as usual and it, everything was going well uh, everything was going perfect i can say but then all of a sudden well let's go back to tashkent yeah, because i want a new challenge so that's the reason why i went to mm -hmm. tashkent um so overall i lived in tashkent for two years and this is the second year actually so starting from september it's going to be the third year so So aside from sense of competition, uh, what are the things, what are other things you like about living in Tashkent? Well, so, um, co competition aside, because I know the place is really competitive. I remember I used to, when I used to work in Tashkent, you would have to, you'd have to, yes, your IELTS score makes a big difference, right? And you have to prove yourself every, yes. every day, every time with regions though, because there's not much supply, you know, teachers, there's shortage of IELTS teachers, you get to dictate the rules, you get to dictate the terms and conditions, and yes. uh, it's, people don't care much about your IELTS as long as you can help them get yes. their test, right? But in, in Tashkent, you have to prove yourself. You have to have the qualifications, the, 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 the competence, the experience. Yeah. So, so aside from all this, what is there is to like about Tashkent? Well, but life just feels different in Tashkent. Uh -huh. Like, I'm just going to give you a very small example, but I guess that's going to help you, you know, draw the mm -hmm. overall picture. Mm -hmm. So uh, now I live in, I've been living in Nawai for about a month. So every time I decide to go out in the evening, mm -hmm. let's just say at night, mm -hmm. at around 11-ish, mm -hmm. there's not, there, there's nowhere to go mm -hmm. to get food uh -huh. to get i mean to see in general uh -huh. right uh but especially the food yeah so uh -huh. but in tashkin it's different yeah uh every time i feel bored or depressed stress i just you know take my family and go somewhere to eat doesn't matter what the time is yeah like it can be midnight it can be you know 3 a.m yeah uh -huh. doesn't matter you can go somewhere and enjoy yourself but that's not the case in Nawai. Um, I guess that's one of the, you know, one of my favorite things about living in Tashkent. Um, you have access to all sorts of entertainment and, of course, food. 
<laughs> so, yeah. you, you strike me as a bit of a foodie. Yes. You like food? Yes, I mean, I am. I uh, well, so what, what's your favorite food? I mean, it's all the, you know, regular stuff, I'd uh-huh. say, yeah. You like traditional food or foreign food? I mean, I enjoy traditional food. Uh-huh. I believe there's no food that can match uh-huh. Uzbek traditional cuisine. Yeah. Um, I enjoy pilav. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, who doesn't, right? So <laughs> I also enjoy all sorts of mm-hmm. traditional foods. And mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of KFC. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, it's Diorbek who introduced me to mm-hmm. KFC. First, I didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, uh-huh. I started to, you know, feel the, uh-huh. you know, vibe. Uh-huh. Let's just say, yeah, now I'm just a big fan of KFC. Mm-hmm. You ever cook yourself? I do, actually. I mean, now I don't uh, because I'm quite busy. But whenever I have time, I do enjoy cooking mm-hmm. some pasta. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm quite good at it, I wow. guess. Because that's the you know, that's one of the foods that I can cook, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so every time yeah. I have time, every right. time I feel like cooking, I cook pasta. Uh-huh. Um, so I kind of mastered it throughout uh-huh. the years, right? And then I can, you know, Mm -hmm. survive. Yeah, Mm -hmm. like can, you know, cook some very basic stuff. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. Cooking is actually something I also learned when I was in the U.S. When I went there in 2019 on as part of the work and travel exchange program, I used to work at this restaurant called Jolly Rogers. And I my first job actually was uh, bussing tables. Mm-hmm. They have something called a bus boy. What, so, what does it mean? So like you serve the table? Uh, no, you are the service assistant. After people have their food and leave, you come and you know clean the table, yeah, yeah. I, I get and it. all the mess and the clutter, and set it up for the next guests. Hmm. So that that was my first job, and I was, I was you actually make good money as a as a bus boy. So you have fixed pay rate, and you get paid tips on top of that mm. so when servers get tipped and that's usually how it works in the u.s uh, customers tip servers yeah, but yeah. We don't they have here. this you know tipping right. culture that's heavily criticized by right you know foreigners uh, it's, it's, it's I, I actually if it wasn't for this tipping culture i would not have made the money i made when i was in the u.s so i started out as a bus boy and i, I figured you can actually make a lot more if you're serving tables. But before I tried that job, they told me that I'd have to try other jobs like uh, being a cashier at the front desk and well, working in the kitchen, uh, meal prep, you know, c- cutting, cutting ingredients and helping the chef. So that was, so when I was in the kitchen, I learned quite a lot about cooking. The chefs there, sh- they showed me ropes of cooking. They taught me how to make Italian food. They, they, they taught me how to make seafood. They taught me how to make American food, uh, fries hmm. and uh, broiling stuff. We would steam uh, all sorts of cooking, right? Uh, except for baking. We didn't do that there. So, and, and, and there's, there, it's, it's actually art. You know, cooking people, people think that cooking is just about putting together some in- ingredients and, and you're done, but it's not that it's not that simple. You can the the something I learned like every every time I'd cook, someone dies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> someone dies. No, no, every time I'm cooking, I I I genuinely try to make something good because I know I get instant feedback from the customer. Right, mm. you get instant feedback if you sell someone an iPhone. Right. And you don't usually get feedback on how good the phone is for a day or two, right? They have to go on, try it. If they don't like it, they'll return the phone. But with your food, if they don't like it, they're calling the manager. Yeah. I want to talk to the manager, please. Yeah. Care, <laughs> and, 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 and because you know that you're instantly going to get that feedback, you have to care about what you're making. You have to pay a lot of attention. And, 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 I, and when I would cook, I would... I would tell myself, if I'm not eating this, then I, I don't think someone else would eat it. So if I'm making this food, I have to pretend as if I'm making it for me. 
mm. not, not just for some random people. So there's this amount of, you know, you, you learn how to be careful, you know, you know how to be more genuine and you know how to be more uh, diligent when you're in the kitchen. And, and so that, that's what, I, that, what that experience taught me when I was in the U.S. And yeah, c- cooking is amazing. And I actually found out that it's a, it's a real turn off for girls. <laughs> yeah, if you, if, you, if you tell them that you can't cook, cook well, that, yeah. That, 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 why? Why is it a turnoff? I don't understand. Yeah, it's a, it's some because it probably feels a little feminine, right? I, I mean, one of <laughs> right. some of the best chefs in the world are Ma- male. Male, oh, I'd yeah, say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe yeah. it's just, it's just because they feel kind of challenged. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, really? What if he's better than I am uh, at cooking? Yeah. Probably. Nah, not uh-huh. this guy. <laughs> let's mm-hmm. find someone who cannot cook <laughs> so then I won't be challenged so <laughs> that's a good point yes yes that's probably exactly why they don't like it when a guy can't cook I mean, right. but but there are actually some girls who do like guys who can cook right I mean, so they want to be able to go home and just kick back while their husband cooks for them right I mean you sound <laughs> like you do talk to a lot of girls to be honest. <laughs> well <laughs> not, not well, uh, let's just say I'm a good conversationalist. I like talking okay. to people. Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I like talking to people. <laughs> I, I'm a good listener. Like when they start talking, they tell you everything. I mean, you're not helping everything. yourself, to be honest, yeah, by saying I'm a good listener. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay, I'm, I, I can cook. I'm a good listener. Uh-huh. I mean, I mean, I mean just, at this point, you're just, I don't know, uh-huh. probably without realizing, kind uh-huh. of, you know, attracting. Uh, too much attention. <laughs> too much attention. Too, too much to attention. Yourself, yeah. yeah, too much attention. Uh, anyway, so back to your life. We were talking about your experience of living in Tashkent, right? You said uh, you like it better in Tashkent, right? Yes. So, did you? You said did you go to universities in Tashkent or no, here? In, uh, I studied in Nawai. Na, Nawai. Yeah. You went to Nawai University, right? Yes. What did you study there? I studied. I studied English. Mm-hmm. English lang- the English language and mm-hmm. literature. Right. That was your major. Yes. So how, how did you pick, pick that major? What made you choose that major? I mean, it was kind of by accident, I'd uh-huh. say, yeah. Because, you know, in our country, there's this, you know, strange thing that you're pressurized into, mm-hmm. you know, getting into university. It doesn't matter which university, you should get into university, yeah. So it happened mm-hmm. with me as well. So I was preparing semi-seriously when I was at the Lyceum. Um, so I was studying English only. Um, I mean, I studied other subjects, but not that seriously. So I decided to, you know, get into a university and mm-hmm. doesn't matter which one, right? So I picked the pedagogical institute, actually, because that was, I mean, in, in, in my hometown, there's only two universities. Um, so there's this pedagogical institute and there's this well, mining institute. Um, one requires physics and math mm-hmm. as the you know core subjects, main mm-hmm. subjects. The other requires English and mm-hmm. you know l- languages in general, right? But well, what so, if you want to get a degree in medicine? You can't go to any school in Navaye. I mean, no, there are, there there are no universities. So you got only schools for engineers and for teachers. That's yes. It. Yes, that, uh-huh. that's so you, you need to, you know, explore mm-hmm. other cities, of course. Yeah. yeah, I see why we have so many students from Navai studying here. Yes, at, yes, at, yeah, that's at, at Bukhara University. Yes, yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, so uh, that happened with me as well. So I just went for English major because, mm-hmm. you know, that was the only university that I had, you know, a slight chance mm-hmm. of getting into. So I just, you know, decided to give it a shot and I actually was accepted. <laughs> and it was a huge surprise <laughs> to my family members and to my teachers. And it all started there, actually. So then when I was still at the university, I was not serious about my studies. Yeah? Mm-hmm. So I was just going, you know, to the university, having fun, not studying. Mm-hmm. And then, um, you know, by not studying, I just kind of improved my language Mm -hmm. skills, my English. And if I'm not mistaken, I was, um, what, a third-year student 
when I started teaching English. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I started with general English. And I happened to like teaching. And then I just mm -hmm. went for it as a profession. Right. But I never thought that I would be a teacher. So your initial experience of teaching was at uh, state lyceums, right? Yeah, like official uh -huh. uh, experience right. started there. But um, I was working at education centers. I was working at home. Uh -huh. So I was, you know, working with smaller kids and teaching them. And then I started after graduating from the university, I started mm. working at a state lyceum mm -hmm. in Naoi as well. So yeah, that's how I gained some experience. How does your experience of working in the public sector compare to working in the private sector? Well, you say there's a big difference. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge difference. Um, so what, in, what is in, going in on in the public, public sector? You know, schools or let's just say lyceums. I didn't feel like I was a teacher. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was sort of a servant mm -hmm. uh, because there are many people who enjoy you know showing you how to do things in mm -hmm. in uh public lyceums or mm -hmm. schools i don't have the experience uh in in working in schools mm -hmm. but i've worked in lyceums so i didn't feel like i was a teacher in mm -hmm. in a, a lyceum mm -hmm. uh because i couldn't teach uh, you have the paperwork apart from the paperwork you have other responsibilities that are not included in your job description so um, I decided to you know quit mm -hmm. um, so but in private sector I kind of love what I do uh, because here now I can be a teacher yeah, I can you know mm -hmm. teach passionately mm -hmm. uh, because I that's the only responsibility that I have if I deliver lessons, you know, well, mm -hmm. if I, you know, uh, show results, if I help students improve, I mean, basically I'm fulfilling my, you know, dream of helping others, you know, as a teacher, let's just say. But in public sector, I mean, that was not the case. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's a huge difference. You got so much paperwork to do that not there, there's the not much paperwork. To I mean, Is it's it? the things that I cannot say. Uh huh. Let's just say. Right. Yeah. So, um, like, like you. Like, I'll give you an example. Yeah. So I used to go to a lesson mm -hmm. uh, in the mornings, and after that, I had my you know own lessons at uh, at an education center, right? So they call you in the middle of the lesson and you are required to be present in the lyceum mm -hmm. because some parents may want to talk to you mm -hmm. um so i mean that's not in my job description to be mm -hmm. honest i mean talking to parents it's okay i can do that through the phone in my uh at my convenience right mm -hmm. but being present in the lyceum mm -hmm. felt just stupid um mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say these, mm -hmm. but you know, we're in a free country, I guess. Yeah, protected by constitution and stuff. Yeah, so, so yeah, that that was a huge put off. Yeah, like uh, it was during these moments that I decided that I would quit mm -hmm. as soon as possible. Yeah, so. Actually, I quit and left for Tashkent mm -hmm. and never looked back. And I don't want to look back. Yeah. <laughs> and I also hear some of the teachers who work here who may switch from public sector to, to the private sector say that they just don't get to experiment when they're in the public sector. I don't know to what extent that's true. Yeah, so I mean, in because you have to. So it's not that true because there isn't. You know, uh, strict curriculum yes, you have to follow. Strict curriculum, you're very much very flexible with mm -hmm. what you do. But, you know, this is also one of the worst experiences I've had in the uh, public sector. Yeah? I was teaching, I was giving my 100%. Yeah? I mean, I don't give my 100% all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So I was giving my 100%. 
to teaching. And I, I was trying to, you know, make students learn English the way in the way that they didn't experience before. Yeah, I tried to, you know, organize games. I tried to, you know, have fun lessons in general. But then they didn't like it. Mm-hmm. And a director once, you know, called me and said, "You're just pressurizing students." Mm-hmm. They don't want to learn in this way. Uh, they want to come and, you know, learn a little bit and then go to extra lessons mm-hmm. to actually learn their major. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I was like, what the hell? Uh-huh. I mean, I was giving them the things that they pay for an extra lesson for free. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably in a better way. So students actually, what kind of killed my passion for teaching at the public sector was the fact that it was students themselves that complained about this. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I cannot work here. Mm -hmm. And that's not for me. Uh, I mean, they need to find another teacher who can actually come here, talk to students Mm -hmm. a little bit, about their personal life or, you know, do let uh, students do whatever they want to do in a lesson. No, I, I'm not si- signed up. I, I haven't signed up for this. No, I was like, no, I'm going to quit. Uh-huh. So, so then I quit. <laughs> so. You think this, this, this will ever come to an end? Like the fact that students have this impression that you go to school I mean, as just long for attendance. As we have teachers that kind of reinforce this kind of behavior Mm -hmm. i don't think it's going to end ever Mm -hmm. yeah because students are lazy uh if you don't push them Mm -hmm. uh, i mean i'm talking about you know teenage students uh, like if you don't push them if you don't explain the importance of uh learning in general like repeatedly and consistently i don't think most of them just feel the motivation and passion to go to the Lyceum or school and actually learn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if you're kind of laid back, uh, like, I mean, they're teenagers and they, they'll learn their lessons once mm-hmm. they grow up and let them do whatever they want to do. I don't think this is going to come to an end. Right. I feel like it would le- what the public sector likes is a, is a, is a sense of sort of competition, right? If you had someone come in and turn things around, say, okay, this is our target for this year, or this is what we're doing within the next quarter, and I mean, and it start actually competing with the private sector, you yeah, would you would you would you would see things would be a lot a lot yeah, more different. Yes. I mean, another thing is that the way I mean, you see, you know, schools and lyceums, yeah. You think that there isn't much going on, Mm -hmm. but I worked and I saw the teachers and I saw the system and I'm not going to generalize, overgeneralize, let's just say, yeah, Mm -hmm. that's not, that may not be the case in, you know, many public schools or lyceums in Uzbekistan, but it's my experience. Yeah. Um, the system just, they have in where I worked cares about you know numbers let's mm-hmm. just say yeah they need students to get into university doesn't matter which university yeah so um i actually had a student um uh who has an excellent ielts score like very very excellent right but th- they were forcing her to get into a university which she didn't want to uh, because they thought that she had no chance getting into a university which she wanted and they were forcing and my student came to me and just asked what should I do yeah so I said well talk to your parents Uh, if they agree just say I mean just go for your dream I mean you have an excellent uh, IELTS score you have an excellent record at the, you know, school at school, so you should be okay. Uh, even though you lose uh, 
a year or two, it's not a big deal, yeah, because she was afraid that she doesn't know the Korean language and she wanted to go to Korea. Uh, she didn't know the Korean language and she, she thought that she would fail, right? So I said, well, learn, study the Korean language. What if you lose another six months? Yeah, it's not a big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's better than going into a university that you did, that you don't want and regretting for the rest of your life. Uh, and and she said okay, um, and I haven't I hadn't heard from her for like another six months, right? And then just last month, yeah, she texted me, yeah, you can congratulate me now. I got into a Korean university with hundred percent scholarship. Um, thank you for the advice. Uh, thank you that I actually followed your advice. Eh? Mm-hmm. So that's the system they have. Eh? They want numbers, they want statistics, uh, but they don't really care much about students' aspirations and dreams and desires. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's something that I didn't like about mm-hmm. the system. Right, mm-hmm. right. But I... Do you think the public sector schools and lyceums are that bad? They, or do, I, I feel like they they have a service that the private sector can provide. They have a role that private sector can't perform. I'm not saying they, they, they are. They teach you things like how to carry yourself in public, how to be respectful of, of elders, right? And show up clean and tidy, right? Put on a good dress, uh, uniform. I mean, you're describing all the good stuff, but, you uh-huh. know, these are all basic stuff, right? Mm-hmm. But if we keep settling for the basics, mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to go, you know, mm-hmm. anywhere, right? Right. So we need to increase the bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, you're saying, well, public schools are okay. I mean, I'm not saying public schools are terrible. They're okay. Mm-hmm. But we shouldn't settle for okay, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, they do teach, you know, how to be a good person in general. <laughs> they do teach some basic knowledge. But, I mean, we should go beyond that, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Public schools. I, I, The public school I went to... The quality of education wasn't top notch, but still, I, I guess I learned quite a lot from the teachers there. It's, it's, if you go to a say like a countryside school, right, you may not get the best education, yes. but the relationships you build and the time you spend there, the extracurriculars you do, uh, the the games you play, yeah, they, the experience they, and the memories, you know. Are good. Yeah, uh, I'm not disputing that, uh-huh. but I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> they they sort of complement each other. The private, the public sector, right? I mean, we uh, we. I'm kind of making the problem uh-huh. sound too simplistic, I guess. Yeah, yeah but because there are too many factors in the mm-hmm. equation. Yeah, so mm-hmm. uh, I'm just talking about one mm-hmm. factor. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, there are lots of things that yeah, need to be, you know, considered. Yeah, clearly you know more about the public sector than I do. I have no experience working in the public sector, so yeah, right. We work, working in the private sector. What are the, what are the schools you worked at as, aside from the Orbeck Isles, and how did you like the environment there? You said you worked at Isles Zone, right? Yes. Uh, how did it feel working there? Really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, uh, what are people there like? People are. I mean. The, People I met there Mm -hmm. were probably one of the nicest people. Mm -hmm. Uh, The teachers, the team, like, you know, all kind of like-minded people uh, with different personalities. Mm -hmm. And actually, I enjoyed working there. Mm -hmm. And Um, was Mr. Diorbeck there around the time you were working? uh, Actually, it was, uh, Diorbeck was leaving. Uh um, And it was him that, you know, recommended me mm-hmm. to Bigzot Mrahmedov to, you mm-hmm. know, replace him basically, yeah. right? <coughs> I'm sorry for that. It's okay. So, um, yeah, I kind of was the replacement for Diorbek mm-hmm. in Isle Zone. So, yeah, I worked there. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, grew my audience in telegram uh, mm-hmm. before i go to went to tashkent i had like you know 1k followers on telegram um, but then i started 
you know, working on myself. Um, I, I actually, it was me. Yeah, I just still believe that um, who who started, you know, sending speaking sample answers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that started in IELTS Zone. Yeah, so I was looking for a niche. Yeah, um, so and the other big recommended. Well, you should choose speaking. Um, and then I said, well, okay. And then I started sending sample answers. And in like two, three months, my channel just blew up. Blew up, right? Yeah. So I gained around 10, 15K followers in like three months mm-hmm. mm-hmm. wow. because I was sending speaking sample answers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were getting shared everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Uh, your- I still see the, you know, earliest post mm-hmm. yeah and i just look at the statistics yeah mm-hmm. so it, it's almost like two hundred thousand shares wow yeah. so uh that's the reason mm-hmm. i mean i said that when i go to tashkent i improve personally mm-hmm. yeah so that that's where it started mm-hmm. that's where i realized well because because when you're in tashkent you better bring your a game right yes yes to, to, um, to stay at the top I mean, to stay to survive there, yes. just to survive there not, not you know, forget about <laughs> staying at the top. Just to stay yes. there in the market, competitive, you have to bring your A game every yes, day. Yes, impossible without right. that. So yeah, um, kind of after that, the public kind of knew me as mm-hmm. like the speaking guy. Uh-huh. Um, and now everybody is doing it. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, it's completely okay. But mm-hmm. I was one of the, you know, pioneers. Uh, yes, pioneers in the game. Yeah, uh-huh. like I started that. Yeah. Mm, because no one was doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the reason why I chose to do it. Mm, it was kind of written in the stars after mm-hmm. all, let's just say. Yeah, because uh, I kept sending, you know, it was late December mm-hmm. when I started doing this. Mm, I kept sending and sending and sending sample answers. Yeah. Um, and it was it what, March? or before that, I just took the test and ended up with a nine in speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of uh, well, magnified the what, usefulness of my channel because it was all experiment, right? Mm-hmm. And I experimented on myself and it worked. Yeah, because before that, I had taken the test several times, like, I don't know, three, four times. And always I would end up with an eight in speaking. Mm-hmm. Eight, 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 no higher than that. But after that, uh, after I sent speaking sample answers and stuff, I took the test and I ended up with a nine in speaking. So it all made sense. Yeah, It all connected the dots for myself and for the people that were, that were you know, following me, right? So then I grew again in terms of my audience and stuff. Yeah. So, um, and uh, then I had to go back to my, you know, hometown because of, you know, family circumstances and stuff. And after I came back uh, to Tashkent, I started experimenting again. But this time, not speaking, but with writing. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> so I prepared for the test. I, I mean, you can still see the sample answers that I sent mm. to my channel in like, Seven days, I sent around 30 essays. Seven days, 30 essays. Yes, wow. because I had nothing to do. I had nothing to do. Mm-hmm. All day long, I would just sit on my computer and write essays. I used to experiment with different vocabulary, different grammatical structures, different uh, format of essays. And I just, uh, after a week, I just take the test, mm-hmm. I just score 8.5 and mm-hmm. writing. And... Again, uh, now this time I became a writing guy. Yeah, <laughs> I used to be a speaking guy. Now I became a yeah. writing guy. Yeah, so th- this is how it went. Mm-hmm. Um, so once I go to Tashkent, I improve my speaking, and the next time I go to Tashkent, I improve my writing. So if I, you know, believe the statistics, if I just see the pattern, so if I stay in Tashkent, <laughs> I will improve a lot of things yeah. in like four or five years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason why I decided to, you know, stay in Tashkent. Mm -hmm. And what's the, what's the next adventure you have in mind now that you conquered the speaking mountain (laughs) and the writing, I I, I mean, speaking and writing uh, mountains. The thing that I'm considering these days is to improve my teaching Mm -hmm. again. Um, and, uh, produce better results, more results, let's just say. Yeah. I mean, 
these days as well, it's just going, you know, fine. But, you know, I'm going to, I'm planning to actually mm-hmm. uh, produce more results, better results. Uh, so to do that, you know, I need to improve my teaching. I need to learn how to teach. I mean, I've been teaching for a while and still there are things that I need to learn mm-hmm. in terms of teaching. So that's the next step, I guess. I also used to think that, you know, once you get IELTS 9, you're done and you should be good, right? You're all set, right? Yeah. Until I started talking to talking to legit teachers, real teachers. I had a few of them on the podcast. Uh, so I had this lady, Savni Desai. Her major wasn't really teaching. She's into law, but she was here part-time working as a teacher. And I had this other lady, I don't remember exactly her name, a visiting teacher from the U.S. And she was telling me about all these different things about creating a safe environment in the classroom, learning and and being able to connect with your students on a more emotional level and knowing how to give proper feedback and and, and knowing how to how to extract what you taught. Yes. And all these things that I never thought about before, right? So you start realizing there are all these different facets of te- teaching. And, and, and I realized that getting nine was not enough. If I wanted better results, I, I yes. better step up my game, my I mean, teaching this game. This is what people, you know, uh, confuse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, yes, having a very high IELTS score helps. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it shows that, you know, you know what you're doing. You know what you're saying. Um, uh, for example, if somebody with, you know, four in IELTS says, well, you should do this to get eight in writing, I would be like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, shut up. Yeah. But when you have actually a 8.5 in writing and you say, well, you should do this to get 7.5 or seven in writing. Mm-hmm. I mean, people mm-hmm. be like, well, he knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. Right. But, you know, saying things is not enough. Uh, you need to be able to show it. You need to be able to, you know, show it or do it in a way mm-hmm. that your students should be able to do the same. Uh, mm-hmm. Because after all, you know, if I cannot deliver what I know to my students, mm-hmm. students, what kind of, what kind of teacher am I? Right. So the most lo- logical thing, the next step that I need to do is to, you know, improve my teaching. Right. Right. What are, what are some personal values you have as a teacher? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, so what are the things you value the most when you walk into the classroom? Your, your, your core, core beliefs or your objectives? Like for some teachers, for example, with me, uh, to my, my core value as a teacher is at, at, the, at the center of everything is results, yeah. all in caps, <laughs> all in caps. So, oh, yeah. and, and, and I'm more of a, it's a more of an entrepreneur way of looking at things. So whatever you do, you need to get that result. So yeah. that, that's, that's one of the, I, I figured that's one of, one of my core values as a teacher. I mean, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the other value I have is uh, creating the best student experience making sure that students, not just learning, they're also having a ton of fun, right? So, and um, which wasn't exact, which hasn't always been my <laughs> core value. It's something I've, I'm starting to learn from more experienced teachers I'm talking to. They're saying that there's more to teaching than just teaching your students what's what, but also uh, creating memories that uh, live lifetime. Yes. You know, stay with them forever. Yeah. Right. And, and ever since I started doing that, uh, it's not just my students who are having fun. I'm also having a ton of fun yes. doing all those things. Yeah. Right. I mean, to me, it's not that different. It's not very much different. Uh, I mean, producing results, mm-hmm. I mean, students getting very good results or the mm-hmm. results that they wanted, that goes without saying. Mm-hmm. But I also try to make sure that specifically with English, yeah, that I try to explain, yeah, if, you know, my students that are watching this, they can confirm this in the, you know, comment section, right? Like, 
I try to encourage them to learn as much as they can. And not just in terms of English. And I always try to explain that the fact that you know the English language at a, let's just say, intermediate or, or advanced, upper intermediate level opens so many doors to you. And mm -hmm. like a lot of doors is just going to serve you as a bridge to the vast amount of knowledge there is like in the world, yeah, in the universe. Yeah. Just use that. Yeah. Make sure that you learn English and while you're, in, you're learning English, learn other stuff as well. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, for example, when you read uh, IELTS passages, right, you can learn a lot of things from them. And students just uh, don't look at the learning process this way usually. Yeah, like it's just they're, go they're going to see the passage uh, as something that they need to, you know, solve uh, the questions and stuff. But when you actually learn the contents, yeah, like inside the passages, I mean, you're going to learn a lot of things. Yeah, you can watch YouTube now. Yeah, you can watch a lot of educational content. Just go watch, learn, and this is going to help you become uh, a well-rounded individual uh, because learning never hurts, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to make sure that students do this. Um, yes, you need to you know, do your homework. You need to learn vocabulary. After that, in the end, you need to produce a very, you need to get a very good result. But along the way, make sure that you learn other things as well, not just English. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's one thing that I have with my students, actually. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about IELTS, right? The way it's set up, you get exposed to information about all sorts of different things. You learn about science, you learn about history. Uh, so uh, you learn about societies, you learn about psychology, a little yes. bit of philosophy and everything. Yeah, I mean, we right? talk about this with the Orbeg a lot, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, So all the, you know, parts of IELTS, it doesn't make sense make sense in except for reading mm -hmm. yeah because listening is just you know you don't learn a lot of things yeah mm -hmm. like part one you i mean it's not going to happen that way yeah so for example if you you know when you're spelling someone's name if you cannot hear them yeah uh, you can always ask yeah you can ask them to write them down yeah mm -hmm. write, write the name down and stuff so, I mean, it's unrealistic, right? In in writing as well, I mean, you're not going to describe a, you know, process to anyone unless you, know, you, you work in some industries and stuff. Uh, they're not going to describe a map, compare a map anywhere in the world, I guess. Mm. Uh, and uh, task two as well. Uh, mm. I mean, you can talk about these things, social issues and stuff, but that's not going to happen in the same way that you are used to do, you're, you're used to doing in the IELTS writing task too, yeah? And speaking, I mean, almost feels like it's stupid except for, you know, some part three questions, right? No one's going to ask you, uh, like, what your favorite flavor of ice cream is uh. and expect you to provide you know, two, three, four sentence response, yeah? You uh, just say, well, I like chocolate uh, flavored chocolate, uh, I mean, ice cream. And they just say, okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Un uh, unless unless you're on a date. <laughs> yes, yeah, unless you're, for example, yeah. uh, well, what type of rain do you like? Yeah, Do you yeah. enjoy rain? Yeah, Unless you're on a date, yeah. Yeah, unless you're trying to uh, 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 rizz up a girl, yeah. no one's going to expect you to provide and a response like, well, I do enjoy the rain, uh -huh. uh, especially in the evenings, <laughs> alone with my thoughts, uh -huh. with my umbrella or without sometimes. I mean, I love it. I mean, no one expects this answer yeah, in, in real life mm -hmm. unless you're uh -huh. trying to, you know, pick up a girl or uh -huh. something. Yeah? It's unrealistic. So breathing part, however just makes a lot of sense to me yeah mm -hmm. you can read you can learn vocabulary mm -hmm. and on top of that you can learn lots of other things and mm -hmm. so if i had to you know pick 
a portion of IELTS mm -hmm. that makes most sense, I'd mm -hmm. say it's reading. Yeah. And it's not just the portion that makes most sense, but it's also the portion that's the easiest. And here's here's why. Mm -hmm. I, I actually earlier was teaching lecture on reading, and the way I usually start my lecture when I teach reading is, guys, let me tell you something. Today we're going to talk about the easiest section of IELTS, and they're all like, "Is it speaking?" I say, "No, it's not. It's actually reading." And here's why. So if you ask me to rank the IELTS modules in the order of the in the order of difficult. the most challenging and yeah, the most difficult or the least easy to the to the easiest number one would probably be speaking because with speaking you got to produce language and top it off you have to do it in front of another person who's entire time staring at you and you're wondering what they're thinking yeah. <laughs> right so if you think about it, there, there's anxiety factor, <laughs> right? And it's all happening in real time, right? Yes. There is no pause button. There is no uh, scratch button. So if you say something, you can't really take it back, right? And the second least easy one is writing. Again, it's a productive skill. You have to come up with everything, right? But except for speaking, uh, no one is watching you and you don't, there's not much anxiety. So you, you have time to think and tidy up your thoughts and put them on paper, right? And then there comes listening. So that's a, that ranks third on my list. But listening, it's actually easy if you think about it, but because there's no rewind button, yeah. if you miss an answer, it's not coming back. Yes. Even if you have the best English in the yes. world, right? And then there comes reading. Reading, 60 minutes, you can do whatever you want with it, yeah. right? You can go back, redo the questions, reread. Right, mm, no you have watching. a lot of control over what you can do. In, exactly. In reading, yeah. yeah, that that's what I'm where I'm getting at with this. So, if you think about it from this perspective, it reading is walk in the park. Yeah, I mean, some it, it, you know uh -huh. viewers might disagree. Yeah, mm -hmm. but statistically speaking, listening is the easiest. Yeah, because mm -hmm. worldwide statistics, the listening mm -hmm. scores are, you know, the highest. Oh, really? Where average where, listening where, score? Where, in where the world. do you get those stats? Like, honestly, I don't know. I mean, where. Uh, once we were preparing a presentation with Theorbeck, I guess. Uh -huh. um, Is there like an official website yes, where you can cut these stats? Yes, yes. Yeah. Wow. First, it's uh, listening. Second on the list was speaking. And mm -hmm. third was reading. And then finally, writing. Mm -hmm. So writing is the most uh, challenging mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. to improve in, in IELTS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's just, you know, statistics, right? But yeah, yeah. But I understand what you're, you know, trying to say. Yeah. I mean, we actually say this for higher, let's just say for higher levels of students, mm -hmm. is the reading that's the easiest, yeah? Because you control, you dictate the game, yeah? I mean, if you screw up, it's all on you, yeah? Because you had everything, yeah? You had the passage, you had the questions, you had the time. You can reread the question and the part of the passage, you know, mm -hmm. as much as you want, right? But like you said, in listening, I mean, it's okay if you miss a question or two, yeah, because you, you don't have the rewind button. So, yeah, I understand yeah, where you're coming from, actually. Mm -hmm. Right. How do you feel about using ChatGPT? Like, how things changed ever since ChatGPT was so, intro introduced? Like, yeah, I, I was, I, do you feel there is still need for those sample answers? Now you have ChatGPT where you can get endless Yes. Number of those samples and yeah, and, and you can even talk to it yes. as a live speaking partner. So I mean, how does ChatGPT change the IELTS game? I mean, kids these days, yeah. Uh -huh. Modern kids <laughs> have it easy, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was just talking to Alisher mm -hmm. yeah, right before this. And I said that the reason why 8s, 8.5s in writing popped up everywhere practically mm -hmm. Is because of ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I mean, I improved my writing with ChatGPT, yeah, and many other you know teachers that I know did so. So I'd say it's a um, positive thing, I guess. Yeah, because you can learn a lot of things. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I'd say you still need need some you know sample answers by trusted. Yeah, uh, members of the IELTS community in 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 Uzbekistan, let's just say, yeah, 
because the thing with chat gpt is if you don't you know write a very good prompt sometimes chat gpt is going to you know overdo it uh, mm -hmm. it's going to add some strange words mm -hmm. and and stuff um and if you for an untrained eye yeah i mean you don't see those things mm -hmm. um, so to get rid of this to improve on this actually you would need a teacher mm -hmm. or teachers actual persons uh sample answers mm -hmm. which were probably written using chat gpt Right. <laughs> so uh because yeah. i use chat gpt to improve my essays yeah mm -hmm. i use chat gpt to brainstorm mm -hmm. but at the same time i know what to steal from it mm -hmm. and i know what to leave it leave it out yeah so in this sense i'd say you still need to read simple answers mm -hmm. written by actual human beings mm -hmm. mm, to see what they are doing um, you can you can actually replicate anyone's sample answer. So, so if yeah, you, you need want to feed the data, I guess. Yeah, 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 right. And it's not just that. So if you look at the sam a lot of the sample answers out there, what they have in common, been eight nine sample answers that they they are neither too formal nor too informal, right? There's they, they hit that spot mm -hmm. where you have that balance of formal and, and informal, and you can instruct ChatGPT to produce exactly that kind of language yeah. so and the, and the prompt i've we have provided our students here is so rewrite my answer so we actually get our students to write their own answer first and have chat gpt proofread it so rewrite my answer with uh, the with a mix of formal and formal expressions and, and some idiomatic language some phrasal verbs all in conversational style hmm. so Use that, you, you use that prompt and the answer you get is something you would hear from a human. Yeah. You can't tell, can tell it's the response is generated by, mm -hmm. by, by robot because there's a little bit of humor element to it too. Yes. And personal touch. And yeah. you're just I mean, amazed how robot is capable of that, of I doing mean, that. I mean, th this is, you know, publicly available version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now imagine what they have. In store, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, in store, yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. So, like I said, anyway, it's all about being able mm -hmm. to write good prompts. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't do that, mm -hmm. I mean, you're basically mm -hmm. going to be embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, because when your teacher, if he's a, you know, a decent teacher, reads your essay, I mean, they know whether it's produced by chat gpt or actual human being yeah so yeah uh, what i do is i always you know give this prompt to my students yeah like you re uh, write an essay or a report and you send it to chat gpt and ask it to improve clarity mm -hmm. so in this way chat gpt mostly is going to you know uh improve the grammatical mistakes and improve the uh, coherence and cohesion as well like it's going to be easier to read and follow mm -hmm. and it's going to improve some you know hiccups in terms of vocabulary as well so it's a very simple mm -hmm. thing and uh, another benefit of using this prompt is that it's not going to change your uh, work a lot uh, there's going to be you know some changes but it's not going to be completely different mm -hmm. uh, to the original one yeah it's a Chat GPT is 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 a, is a godsend. I just I just imagine what our English would be like, or where we would be with our intelligence and knowledge if we had this tool growing up. If we had this tool when we were fifteen, sixteen. Yeah. I, in that sense, I sort of envy kids these yeah. days. They have I all mean, these. It's, it's all hypotheticals and yeah. stuff, but I don't know. Yeah. yeah. It's it's still not late though. We, we got to keep up with it. We got to keep yes. keep up with this thing. Because if we don't, and there are kids who are growing up using this thing, mm. and and in a couple I mean, of years, couple of years time, when there's a new generation of teachers, they're gonna be so much, so much better than us. Yeah, I mean, right. I see that happening mm -hmm. actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just uh, really exciting what the future holds with all these changes happening right now, I actually sometimes even wonder if there's going to be need for IELTS instructors in two, three years time. And because there's a good 
possibility we might all be out of work with chat gpt <laughs> because because it's really a matter of time before they make the 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 voice assistant hyper realistic to the yes. point that it's indistinguishable from a teacher yes and yes bring it to the to the class and there you go you don't need a teacher anymore well i'm not sure about the you know you don't need a teacher anymore part but uh -huh. yeah i don't see it happening in like you know two three years time but mm -hmm. eventually maybe there's a good chance that it will happen, mm -hmm. uh, we will, you know, be put out of jobs and stuff. Mm -hmm. But you know, I'll be seventy or something. <laughs> Why should I worry? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. I hope I won't be teaching IELTS when I'm seventy. Yeah, yeah or so. we'll just be having more of these podcasts. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just sitting down and reminiscing good old days yeah. uh, with no chat GPT, right? Uh, what do you say we talk about your? Now, before we talk about your personal interests, before we get to that part, there's a question I want to ask you. Do you have any pet, pet peeves as a teacher? Um, like, so, I mean, I'm not sure if I can call that a pet pe peeve or anything. <laughs> but if you are a student mm -hmm. and you don't take notes during the lessons, mm -hmm. I mean, you're doomed. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not destined for greatness, let's just say. Uh -huh. uh, yes, you can get seven, mm -hmm. but you're not going to get 7.5. Uh -huh. Yeah, you can get 7.5, but you're not going to get eight. Yeah, so that's the thing that bothers me. Yeah, so if I, for example, I mean, uh, usually we have this, you know, sessions mm -hmm. uh, before we start the lessons and stuff, yeah. So I just pay attention to students and see if there are any one taking notes. If I see someone taking notes, I just be like, wow, mm -hmm. I mean, that's an excellent student. Yeah. That student is going to get an eight. Yeah. Uh, that, that, because I know that they're going to get a very good score. Uh -huh. uh, that shows, mm -hmm. yeah. If you're just, you know, kind of listening uh, we IELTS teachers sometimes talk a lot, uh, explain a lot of things during the lessons. Yeah, um, for example, if you're reading something, uh, reading lesson, imagine uh, you see a nice phrase, uh, vocabulary, and I say, well, you can use this in a mm. report. You can use this in an essay, and this is how you can use it. Mm. I'm going to provide, you know, three, mm. four examples, right? If you don't take notes, I just feel like, well. You're not going to get. You can you can just set it as a rule, though. You yeah, can, I mean we, uh, but it's just at the beginning. But uh -huh. when I see mm -hmm. many students not taking note, mm -hmm. I just be like, "Here's mm -hmm. a rule. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should do X, Y, Z." Mm -hmm. I I then explain it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but if a student does it, you know, themselves, I mean, well, mm -hmm. that's going. That student is going to get. More attention, yeah. No hard feelings, mm. other students, but that student is going to get more attention from me. <laughs> yeah. Special treatment, yeah, because I know that they're a very excellent student. Yeah, mm. I'm yeah. not saying that other mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. you know, don't get any attention, but mm -hmm. you know, that student is going to. Those students mm -hmm. are going to get special treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at least when they take notes, they're showing that commitment and yes. willingness to play along, saying that they are there to co cooperate. Mm. Like, it, it's like, imagine you're on a date and your date is always on his phone. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know that they're not interested. You know that they're not that serious. Eh? Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying you should take notes during, you know, dates. Yeah. <laughs> that would be, you know. Weird. <laughs> weird, awkward. Eh? Imagine sure. yeah, taking notes in front yeah. of you. Yeah. Your date so. would think you're a nerd. <laughs> you're still yeah. in school. But so. in a lesson, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a mm -hmm. different story. One of the things you mentioned when I reached out to you and asked you about your uh, asked you for your CV is the things you mentioned on on that CV. You said that you're into video games. Yes, you like playing Huge video games. Huge fan. All right, let's talk about that. Yeah. So, what is your favorite video game? I mean, I play Dota, uh, Defense of the Ancients. Probably you probably oh, heard. Oh, we got a big Dota fan. Oh, where did Abbas go? Is that he's out, he's outside? My brother Abbas. He's a He's a massive Dota fan. Uh, I'm, I'm probably going to kick his <laughs> ass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, he's been, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, semi-professional, yeah, right. in, in terms of... I've been playing it for, mm -hmm. I don't know, 
15 years. 15 years. <laughs> so, Lifelong player. So uh, that's crazy. I used to have a friend when I was in the when I was staying at university dorm, and he would play Dota two, three, four o'clock in the morning. He'd still be on his computer. I mean, I and, do the same. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, these days, yeah, just, because I have a lot of free time. Yeah. Uh-huh. So I do that. Uh-huh. Not every day, but sometimes. I, mean, time I, to time. I don't get it. What is it about this game that's so so? I mean, it's simple. It's addiction. Addict, yeah. Addiction. <laughs> right? Addictive. Uh, addiction. I'm, I mean, not that. I mean, my addiction is not. Mm-hmm unhealthy i'd say mm-hmm. yeah because i know when to stop mm-hmm. um but you know there's something that you know keeps me go back to this mm-hmm. game i mean it's a very old game yeah mm-hmm. it was produced in 2000 mm-hmm. probably yeah mm-hmm. so many people don't play it anymore yeah? mm-hmm. but we have this small community in uzbekistan mm-hmm. um, we have the platform actually where we can play with other people from different countries Mm -hmm. online right Mm -hmm. so um yeah it's sort of a it serves as a let's just say get away from Mm -hmm. the daily stress depression and Mm -hmm. stuff Mm -hmm. and it's the there i can focus yeah focus completely on the game Mm -hmm. i just forget about everything Mm -hmm. i just forget about my family i just forget about Mm -hmm. my friends Mm -hmm. yeah i'm making it sound like it's a good thing but Mm -hmm. You know, you get the point, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I can totally relate to what you're saying. I, when I was a teenager, I used to play video games a lot. But I liked mission games more, not games like is Counter-Strike or this Dota. I, so the game I used to play growing up was... So the first one I played was Transformers when the game came yeah. out. And then I played Prototype, and there's yeah. two of them. Alex, yes, the main I, know, I know. I remember. I, mm-hmm. I actually worked as an... Administer, uh-huh. uh, administrator, what do uh-huh. you call? Uh, at a computer a, club, yes, <laughs> yeah, game club, a game club, right? <laughs> so I know right. all those games. I, I played all those games, yeah. not you know, mm-hmm. religiously, but mm-hmm. you know, I know. You ever completed any of those mission games, like from so, from beginning there, to there end? There used to be a game, mm-hmm. um, what Prince of Persia? Do oh you remember my that? God. Are you uh, serious? You played that game? Yes, I played that. I mean, there, I, there I were different it. versions I, of it. I, I, I love uh, it. I, mean, it, I love it, playing this I game. I completed that game when I was uh-huh. at school. Yeah. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. I recently looked up the game, but mm-hmm. I couldn't find uh, the one that I could install mm-hmm. on my computer. Mm-hmm. So it, it sucks. So instead, mm-hmm. I installed Call of Duty mm-hmm. and completed it again. Wow. Um, I'm into, you know, shooting games as well. Mm-hmm. I play Counter-Strike as well, mm-hmm. professionally. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I'm also into, you know, mm-hmm. sniper games. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I remember once uh, I played Call of Duty like six, seven hours, mm-hmm. like a day until I completed it. Um, and then I was, you know starting to lose my touch with the reality as well Mm -hmm. because every time i go outside Mm -hmm. i was like you know Mm -hmm. checking out the windows yeah Mm -hmm. if there's there was a sniper or something (laughs) i was just checking everywhere yeah yeah so Mm -hmm. that that's how i used to play video games you ever had nightmares Uh, because when you play those shooting games a lot you actually have nightmares not nightmares but dreams yes Uh, I actually play uh-huh. Dota still in my dreams. Yeah, <laughs> uh, whenever I play Dota for like you know two three hours uh-huh. and sleep, I used to have mm-hmm. you know dreams about the game and I play mm-hmm. the game. But nightmares? Mm-hmm. Nah. I remember I used to play this game ca- called Medal of Honor. I don't know mm-hmm. if you know it. It's about a war in Afghan. Yeah. Right, and you get to play one of those American soldiers. Right, there's this one mission and I got stuck. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know if I had to duck. Sometimes you have to duck to <laughs> dodge the bullets. And I didn't know if I had to use some kind of a shield. I couldn't get past that stage of the game, right? I was stuck there. And and I kept trying that level over and over and over again. Couldn't. I went, I go to bed that night and I actually n- have nightmare, little nightmare where I am that soldier and I'm getting shot at, <laughs> Right. I couldn't yeah. go to. I didn't. I could not go to sleep that night, right? So I mean, that happens. Yeah. It, it sometimes the, the you just that that 
boundary between reality and the, the game just disappear. Yeah. Disappears and you feel like you're in that game, you're that character. They, they actually made a bunch of movies about that, I think. It, Uzbek movies about the, the, the effect of video games on kids' psychology and their... I, mean, I don't well-being. watch Uzbek, right. you know. I, I don't watch them either, but I remember <laughs> watching one when I, a while back, long, mm-hmm. long, long time ago. I don't watch Uzbek content anymore, guys, if anyone wondering, because <laughs> I always tell them I'm always watching English content. And yeah, there, there are all these circles, people form circles, they, they sometimes bet, right? Yeah. They, it's, it's a whole different world yes. of gamers. Yes. Right? It's, actually, it's now a sport. <laughs> Yes. Or you can you can play this game professionally and make good money. Yes. I mean, there's actually a guy from Bukhara uh-huh. uh, who's a professional Dota player. Uh, uh, Aziz. Yeah, Aziz. Aziz, okay. I thought his Aza, name was... Aza. Aza yeah. Um I mean, uh, I mean, she makes good money uh-huh. just by streaming uh-huh. uh, in Uzbekistan. Yeah, he makes, I mean, very good money. Mm-hmm. So I watch him sometimes. Uh-huh. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I watch him play Dota sometimes. Yeah, when I'm bored, and he he plays, you know, like a professional would. Yeah. Uh-huh. So um, yeah, now it's a cyber sport. Uh-huh. But when I was in school, it was you know something that was illegal or banned. <laughs> yeah. Now it's actually encouraged. Yeah. Uh, just yesterday, the Orbic sent a screenshot. I mean, I talked to my experience of gaming and stuff to uh, to the Orbic about, uh, all the time, and he recently sent a screenshot of a study that showed that video games, playing video games, is actually good for your mental health. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So uh, for things like strategizing, planning, coordination. No, no or, it's or just, just uh, you know when you play. It, it's almost like when you do your favorite thing uh-huh. you feel happy yeah that's right. it it's it's simple as that yeah yeah but th- there is hidden cost as well right it's, yeah it's, it's your health you have to sit, sit in the yeah, desk place. all day long and play the game and and my brother who played dota a lot he, he's now got this condition eye condition and he needs operation I know when he's getting it, but one of the reasons why he developed that is because because of yeah. long screen exposure. Yeah, long that hours happens. staying up late and playing Dota. Yes, that so happens. That you gotta you gotta keep that in mind. You gotta yes. keep that in I mind. Mean, because if you if, you, if, if you now say to kids like it's good for your well being, yeah, <laughs> they're all gonna get on their computer, strike up a balance, yeah, yeah. strike a good balance, start playing balance. Dota. So yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, right. So we did quite a bit of talking about games. I, one other interest you have is working out. Yes. I mean, do, I, do, I don't do say that I work out consistently right. enough, let's just, but I do work out mm-hmm. from time to time. Is it, do you usually work out alone or you work out with your friend, Mr. Alone. Diorbeck? Alone. Uh, yeah. I so, mean, we live... Mm-hmm quite apart from each other mm-hmm. yeah? like he lives in a different part of Tashkin I live mm-hmm. in different so getting together but you know mm-hmm. there were times we worked together in the same gym mm-hmm. uh, but these days yeah we were, we're in a different location right and uh, what's your workout routine like uh, you want to talk about that a little, little as well yeah, I like, enjoy doing cardio mm-hmm. a lot actually half of my you know Workout routine is mm-hmm. dedicated to doing a very good cardio mm-hmm. yeah, because I need that, you know, I need to get the heart, mm-hmm. heart rate up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's good. And what do you do? You run on the treadmill? You uh, do I, I cycle. Uh-huh. I, I mean, the thing is, uh, in order to make it more interesting, I try different uh, ways of doing cardio. Uh, first, I start easier with cycling because that's mm-hmm. not, too bad for your joints. Um, but then uh, once I do it for like 10 minutes, I, then I switch to treadmill. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I run for about 20 minutes. Right. Good, good, good. So you do a total of 30 minutes of cardio, right? Yes. And then after mm-hmm. that, I work out, I mm-hmm. mean, uh, mm-hmm. lifting and stuff uh, mm-hmm. for another 30 or 40 minutes. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Right. So w- what's your fitness goal like uh, right now? Are you, are you doing it just to stay fit or you want to you wanna stay some? fit mostly because, you know, as a teacher, I don't have a very much physically active life mm-hmm. and to kind of balance this out to compensate for it, if you will. So I do a little bit of working out mm-hmm. to stay fit. I mean, yeah, at the beginning, I had this target of, you know, achieving this, uh, you know. Sebum physique. Yeah, sebum <laughs> physique, muscle <laughs> definition and stuff. Yeah. But, you know, you need to, if you uh, want to achieve that result, you need to do it consistently mm-hmm. and you need to do it religiously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, you need to do it as a profession. Mm-hmm. But, you know, for now, I guess. Mm-hmm. If I can stay fit, mm-hmm. mm, I mean, that, that, that's, 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 a, that's a realistic goal for a lot of average people like us, right? Yeah. Those body shapes we see on social media, those people have their yeah. personal trainer, they have their doctor, they have their dietitian, dietitian. <laughs> they have, I, they, they, they're on 10 different supplements, yes. vitamins, right? <laughs> I mean, it's they're, too they're, expensive they're, it, it, to get that yeah. shape, I guess. Yeah, and it's too risky. Mm-hmm. So recently I started watching a lot of, you know, uh, gym content. Mm-hmm. I sent one to you as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Mike. Dr. Mike. I mean, he's my favorite. Uh-huh. At the beginning, I didn't like him. Uh, but now he's my favorite. because. But, but this guy's going around and trash talking all Hollywood actors. Yeah, that's what I enjoy. <laughs> yeah, like the, the sarcasm he yeah. has and the jokes on uh-huh. Hinch jokes he makes i mean uh-huh. i just i mean right. I, I i like them yeah i i actually watched this video of him critiquing uh, hugh jackman's physique he was in the movie deadpool versus wolverine yeah. recently yeah if you watch that movie yeah the, i watched the, that movie the final scene where you see his yeah. abs just impossible for someone his age yeah he's, he's 50, 55 yeah or something right now I right mean, do you think those abs are real I mean, can be, yeah. Right. I mean, he's 55, and if you've been working out mm-hmm. even slightly, mm-hmm. but consistently for like 25 years, mm-hmm. I mean, I guess it's not that realistic. But keeping, being in, actually, I watch a lot of, you know, uh, videos of actors reacting mm-hmm. to, to themselves, right? Mm-hmm. And they say that being in that shape, I, I mean, um, yes, they work out, but they don't look that way mm-hmm. every day. Yeah. yeah, because they say that to shoot a scene like this, mm-hmm. they stay dehydrated for like three days, for like a week. You're probably talking about Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill. He, he's, yeah, he, I, he, I, he I said, watched he, him too. He said um, in one of yes. his interviews for his role, Witcher, there's, yeah. a, there's a naked scene when he's in the bathtub. And he said he was dehydrated for almost yeah. the entire day. Yes. And I watched, uh, I mean, I've seen other actors mm-hmm. saying the same thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, I also watch now like Mr. Olympias and mm-hmm. stuff. And they say that before the show, uh, they stay dehydrated. Yeah, because your muscles are, I mean, mm-hmm. you have a lot of water in your mm-hmm. body and mm-hmm. that that may prevent mm-hmm. you from looking jacked mm-hmm. on the stage so you should stop drinking water uh, or right. any liquid for that matter mm-hmm. so i mean yeah it's it looks for the cameras but it's unhealthy mm-hmm. but i mean uh from watching the videos of dr mike and likes of him i realized that when it comes to the definition or what people have in mind when they hear the word a healthy person is totally, you know, different Mm -hmm. to what actually a healthy person looks like. Um, So when I say a healthy person, people might imagine someone, you know, like with very, you Mm -hmm. know, good muscle definition and stuff. Uh Yeah, like... Like very low body fat percentage, yeah, mm-hmm. like abs showing and stuff. But in most of the cases, that's not how it works, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, being healthy, I mean, 
there was this guy uh, who who actually lifts. Yeah, he he's very jacked and stuff, and he reacts to a woman yeah, mm-hmm. running, and that w- woman is slightly obese. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, out, out not shape. obese. I wouldn't say, but uh, she has shape, right. She has this, you know, probably higher body fat percentage and stuff. Yeah? And people were making fun of her. Mm-hmm. Like, you're not healthy. Something, something, mm-hmm. something. You should lift and stuff. And the guy who's jacked reacts to that video and says, people might probably think that I'm healthy, but I'm not. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm actually very good at lifting very heavy weights. Um, but you know, that that's, we usually have the wrong image of mm-hmm. what a healthy person looks like actually. Mm-hmm. So if you see somebody mm-hmm. who's Jack with, you know, huge arms and, you know, chest and, and six pack or eight pack, mm-hmm. I mean, yes, that person can be healthy, mm-hmm. but that's not the standard of a healthy mm-hmm. person. Yeah. That's, that's how science would define that's not how science would define a healthy person yeah mm-hmm. so i'm not an expert though yeah i'm, yeah. Not, I'm here talking about you know health and stuff but 100 yeah, <laughs> percent. yes everything we say on the podcast comes with a big fat disclaimer okay yeah. we're not health experts we're not fitness trainers yeah, yeah. but you it's know just personal it's just experience. mostly my experience of fitness mostly mm-hmm. comes from youtube videos that i watch mm-hmm. that's about it right right <sighs> We did talk about your personal interests quite a lot. And on next part of the podcast, I was hoping we could talk a little about your, you know, future plans, right? I mean, and I, not, 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 not in the way you think, not, not exactly about your career, but rather about your personal life, like marriage. Would you be comfortable talking about that as well? And the questions I'll be asking you about are quite general. Not I mean, too specific. I mean, let's go for it. So, uh, as someone bachelor looking for a partner, what are some qualities you look for in a good spouse? I, I think that wouldn't look good as a married man. Uh-huh. Oh, you are. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So imagine me describing uh, what <laughs> I what. I look for it. I, I just in, didn't in, see that wedding so, wedding ring on your finger. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't, were, I don't wear, wear yeah, so a I wedding thought, ring. I thought but. he was bachelor. My bad. <laughs> I dropped the ball here. So I actually, I was actually married, and I have a son, uh-huh. two year old son. Uh-huh. Um, so I have plans for him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I mean, he was. I mean, he still is mm. very into kicking balls. Uh-huh. <laughs> Quite literally and yeah. figuratively, yeah. So, um, I mean, he's into football. Uh-huh. Uh, like everywhere he goes, he carries a ball uh-huh. with him, uh-huh. and he, he he enjoys it. So, I I was thinking that if I can, mm-hmm. um, I if he doesn't change his mind, yeah, of course, I would make him a f- football player, mm-hmm. professional football player, probably. Not in Uzbekistan, but in other countries mm-hmm. where there are good academies for young football players. Right. What are, What are some lessons you want to teach your kid before he grows up? What are some lessons you think he should know uh, and it should be part of his childhood? Well, some. Uh, it's the basic stuff, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, this is my first child and... Mm-hmm. I'm just experimenting. Mm. Yeah. Uh-huh. So, um, but in general, <clears throat> uh, I want him to have some values like uh, respect, kindness towards others, um, and in general, be a good person. Um, so, to do this, I'm always trying to, you know, give him examples. Um, I try to. Uh, even though I don't help around the house a lot, but whenever my son is watching, I try to help his mom. Yeah, I try to help my mom. I try to help my dad yeah, so that he can see and do the same. Yeah? So the other day, actually, I was doing some push-ups. Yeah? And he just 
came next to me and tried to do the same. And that kind of mm -hmm. gave me an idea of what I should do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I should show him mm -hmm. uh, how to be a good person. Yeah. So um, that's what I'm trying to do these days. Mm -hmm. So like kids, kids don't do what they're told, but they do what they see, right? Yeah, up until a certain age, mm -hmm. that's the case, I believe. Yeah. So I just um, say things, ask him to do things that he doesn't do. But whenever I do things, he wants to repeat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he wants to do it exactly the same way I did it. So, I mean, up until a certain age, I want to do this. And after, you know, as he matures, probably, I hope, yeah, he will do things that I will ask him to do without me showing how mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, these are the short term and long term plans. Right. Apparently, it's quite a quite a daunting prospect if you think about it, right? I mean, it I is think. sometimes, but I'm enjoying it to be honest. Uh -huh. um, because as you see your child growing up, mm -hmm. you get this feeling that you never had before. Mm -hmm. uh, he is two now, and he started, you know, saying a couple of words mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, uh, now he can say dada. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Um, uh in the mornings sometimes in the afternoon these days yeah he he just comes up and says da 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 to wake me up oh really uh, i mean <laughs> that's just going to make you feel i don't know yeah. different yeah um, i never had this feeling naturally before yeah so i'm enjoying it mm -hmm. sometimes he comes up to me and hugs me for no reason mm -hmm. yeah like beats me for no reason yeah so that's a different kind of feeling. I cannot mm -hmm. describe it, to be honest. Yeah, you need to just experience it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. You just gotta experience it, right? Yes, right. I just, I, 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 I can only imagine like how surreal it is having kids, like having a mini version of you. Yes, right? I mean everybody <laughs> says that. Yeah, like yeah. he is the spitting image of you. <laughs> um, everybody right. says that. I mean, I, sometimes I think, is it good? Uh, uh -huh. Is it good that my child mm -hmm. looks like me? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's natural that he looks like you. Come on, yeah. here is that. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, yeah, it, he looks like me in terms of the you know physical image and stuff. Uh -huh. But I'm talking. I'm 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 saying in general. Mm -hmm. Is it good that if my child looks like me, mm -hmm. growing up, mm -hmm. yeah, and I just you know, avoid that question <laughs> because the answer is not the one that I want it uh -huh. to be. Yeah, let's, let's just say. Right. So yeah, uh, that's how it's going these days. Yeah. Sounds interesting. Well, it was, we're almost, we're about to hit the two hour mark, I guess, right? So, so we before just, before we before we wrap it up, there are a few more questions I want to ask you ask ask of you, and uh, so we, we have sort of a tradition on this podcast where we uh, talk a little philosophy towards the end, and there are a few questions of philosophical theme I want to ask you if uh, you're fine with that. And so my my first question is, how would you? How would you des describe your personal philosophy? I mean, could you? It's, could it's you? Here, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I was actually are the meaning to ask you by. why why you have that writing on your t shirt. This is these are the words that I live by. It is what it, it is. is. What it is. It, it, what it actually happened. <laughs> it, it, this this actually line rings a bell. Is it? Is that what Michelle Obama said? Right. I mean, a lot of people say it. it yeah, so. She actually, her video went viral for saying that. There's a video of her saying it is what it is, and they, it made it a meme or some, of some sort. Yeah. I'm, I kind of associate mm -hmm. this phrase with Joey from Friends. Mm -hmm. Joey. Yeah, there, there was a scene uh -huh. uh, where somebody asked Joey, like, mm -hmm. how do you not care? <laughs> and he goes like, just like this. Yeah, so uh, it is what it is. Yeah, it is like, what it is. Don't sweat it. Fall, this is... I mean, thinking too much about what you cannot change. Uh huh. 
doesn't make sense. Just right. focus on the things that you can change. Mm -hmm. And that's my philosophy, I'd mm -hmm. say. Yeah. It's a very uh, easy going. <laughs> yes. Easy going, <laughs> chill attitude. Right. If you could, if you had time machine and could travel back in time, what's something you would tell your younger self? I mean, I had Six. this question before. Um, On a podcast? No. Yeah, I mean, sometimes I used to do this, you know, live streams to uh -huh. just talk to my audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somebody asked this question yeah, and I didn't, I couldn't answer this question. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if I can answer it right now, but let me think about it. Um, so, um, I'd say, I'd probably say, well, younger me, mm -hmm. yeah, life is unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Things can change like very quickly. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I think when I just think about my childhood, yes, of course, I do have very good memories. And I also have very, you know, bad memories too. So I just, I'm, I'm just saying these words, um, future me saying this to my younger self, uh, when I think about the bad things. And yeah, like, yeah, bad things are happening, but life is unpredictable. Things can change anytime. So there's no reason mm -hmm. to worry too much about it right right so yeah that 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 These and just learn how to roll with things yes how to roll probably that you need to learn to be resilient uh -huh. yeah you need to learn how to adapt to different situations and that's how it goes mm -hmm. wow yeah quite interesting and this podcast right now is being watched by your future self hmm. Yeah, most probably you in two weeks or three weeks. Or maybe you might decide to revisit this podcast when you're 30. So what's one message you have to your future self? What's something you would say to your future self if you could? I'm, I'm too dumb uh, you, you might actually wave at him right now. He's watching you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, I'm sure that things are working out for you yeah, quite well. Yeah. Um, I'm sure that you're, you know, in a better place than you are right now. So, <laughs> so keep it going. Yeah, keep up the good work. You're doing fine, I guess. Yep. <laughs> so, you got this. <laughs> you got this, right. <laughs> right. All right, Mr. Jarabek, it was a ton of fun talking to you today. I, I enjoyed every bit of it. And I honestly can't thank you enough for coming on the show and sharing with us your experience, uh, as a teacher and your, you know, stories, all these insights and uh, cool jokes and everything. <laughs> yeah. I, I thank you a lot. Thank you mm -hmm. for having me as well. I enjoyed talking to you too. So it's, thank you. Yeah. All right, guys, if you enjoyed today's episode, don't forget to subscribe and like our content and leave your comments in the comment section below. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs>